All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming into the P2EP Annual Research Symposium. My name is Neha Mittal, and this is my second year in the P2EP program serving as a graduate mentor. And I'm also a third year PhD candidate in the Department of Biological Sciences at University of North Carolina at Charlotte. So this summer, me and my interns both work on the metabolomics projects in sweet potato and soya beans. So before we start our presentation, I would like to introduce my awesome interns who helped me a lot in this summer of, in both of the projects. So I have Brittany next to me from Rowan Cabarrus Community College, Antonio from North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics, Chika from University of North Carolina at Charlotte, Karina from Kadawa College, and last not the least, Ellen from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So with this, I would like to hand over to Brittany, who is going to talk about the soybean project. Thank you, Neha. So why are soybeans important? Soybeans are used in our everyday life in numerous products. Just to name a few, we have soy milk, soybean oil, and it's also used in protein shakes for any gym buffs out there. So due to all of the uses of soybean, it is highly cultivated, and it's also one of the largest protein feeding crops that we have which is a great alternative for vegetarians or people with restricted diets who need these essential amino acids. However, this crop is facing a devastating pathogen attack of the soybean cyst nematode. And here I'd like to illustrate the graph on the left is the soybean distribution as far as where the crop is grown. And on the right, we have where the attacks are occurring. And there are some overlays within these maps. So now we have so why is this pathogen so devastating? We have a susceptible soybean root where there's a protein in case shell that houses thousands of eggs. Once favorable conditions have occurred, this protein will be broken down and the eggs will be released into the soil where the nematode will hatch. It penetrates the soybean root, it'll make a feeding site for itself, suck all the nutrients from the soybean, therefore causing this plant to weaken and prohibit its growth. Now male nematodes will come out where females will stay attached and create this cycle again with unfertilized eggs for the male to come and fertilize. Now on the other side, we have resistant nematode, or resistant soybean root, where the nematode will try to attach but will not be able to uh, make a feeding site for itself. Therefore, the soybean will be able to grow and the nematode will not complete its life cycle. So our cultivars are um, susceptible due to the ever-evolving um, nematode and our cultivars are less resistant. So our objectives are to um, a, make a cultivar that is multiple, resistant to multiple SCN uh, races and to enhance the nutrient value from help for health promoting effects. Through this, we use metabolomics and genomics. Thank you, Brittany. So we chose wild soybean species, the glycine soja, as a study system for our research because of its much greater genetic variety compared to its domestic cultivar. Now, a common strategy that plants use to defend against pathogens and infections is to induce a chemical response. And we chose this strategy to analyze for our project. For example, pests will attack any area of the plant. And because of the stimulus, um, it, the plant will induce a chemical response which is harmful to the pests. This will either kill the pests or inhibit the pest growth. After that, we screen two wild soybean ecotypes treated with SCN, one resistant, RT, one susceptible, ST. After three days, the nematodes are freshly hatched, so there's about the same number of them in both ecotypes. After five days, the nematodes are mostly unsuccessful creating feeding sites on the resistant treated ecotype. And after eight days, you can hardly count three nematodes on our resistant-treated ecotype compared to the almost uncountable number of nematodes in the susceptible-treated ecotype. In order to determine which compounds are being induced in our resistant-treated ecotype, we chose to measure global metabolomic profile changes in our samples. Our first step in our procedure was to extract root tissue samples from our soybean and to crush them with liquid nitrogen for an LCMS analysis. After that, we processed our data, annotating our compounds based off of exact mass and retention time, and measured their abundance in our samples with peak area from our mass spectrum data. We then performed all other statistical analyses using our programming and an online tool, MetaboAnalyst. So we generated a heat map which shows significantly expressed compounds. 
On the y-axis, you'll find our compounds, and on the x-axis, you'll see our samples. We divided our samples into four groups based on our two distinct ecotypes, resistant and susceptible, and then further into treatment and control, as you can see with the color bar at the top. Based on fold change differences, we then divided our compounds into four groups. We were just interested in the compounds that were upregulated in our resistant treatment group, or group four. Now red stands for upregulation and blue stands for downregulation on this heat map. So in group four, the compounds that we found were mostly consisting of phenolic acids and isoflavonoids. And over the next few slides, I'll talk to you guys about what pathways the group four compounds belong to. So the box plots that you see here represent compound variation between groups, and we performed a post hoc analysis for statistical significance validation. So starting with D-phenylalanine, which acted as a common precursor compound to both the isoflavonoid and phenolic acid pathways, we get diazidine to be significantly expressed, as you can see with the green box plot in our resistant treatment group. Its conjugates upon methylation and glycosylation were also produced and significantly expressed, as you can see with their corresponding box plots. This significant finding suggests that the isoflavonoid pathway may play a role in resistance. Now onto the phenolic acid pathway. The 3,4-dihydroxybenzoic acid compound was significantly expressed in our data. Upon glycosylation of 4-hydroxybenzoic acid and 3,4-dihydroxybenzoic acid, we see that the glucoside ester conjugates are also significantly expressed. Now interestingly, glycosylation of our significant compound precursors lead to compounds that show even greater significance than their precursors suggesting that this chemical process plays a role in defense signaling in the plant. Now our novel finding is that 4-hydroxybenzoic acid, 3,4-dihydroxybenzoic acid, as well as their glucoside ester conjugates were significantly expressed. Yet this is something that has not been previously studied in regards to soybean cyst nematode resistance. Now the significance of these findings is that if we can find our key significant metabolites and their corresponding pathways, we can use this knowledge to contribute to metabolomic engineering of the soybean, which then could lead to global yield increase, enhancement of nutritional and pharmaceutical value, and then also contribute to SCN resistance. And now, Karina will talk to you guys about the sweet potato and metabolomics. So for our project, we use global metabolomics to study salt stress in wild sweet potato species. Sweet potatoes are a highly nutritious crop. They contain large amounts of vitamin A, B6, beta carotene, and manganese. They can help improve your blood sugar regulation and promote the digestive tract. They also serve as a healthier alternative to regular potato chips. So imagine if sweet potatoes were taken away from our diet. It would be very difficult to replace sweet potatoes with a crop that could provide the same nutritional value. Hence, the importance of sweet potatoes, especially in rural areas. Salt stress is a major abiotic stress affecting sweet potato crops. It can inhibit plant growth and ultimately decrease the yield of the crop. So we use targeted and untargeted global metabolomics to study the effects of salt stress, and this would help towards developing a salt-tolerant crop with a high nutritional profile. We use two wild-type species, Beach Morning Glory, which is our salt-tolerant plant, and White Star Morning Glory, which is our non-tolerant plant. For both species, we use root and leaf tissue samples. These tissue samples were prepared and methanol extracted. It was processed through GCMS, and that mass spectra was later annotated based on mass retention time. We performed all statistical analyses using Metabol Analyst software and our programming. We did multivariate analysis to analyze the root and leaf tissue. For our six columns, we have our control group for both the salt tolerant and salt non tolerant species. And then we have our treatment group on the last six columns for our salt tolerant and salt non tolerant species. Below that, as you can see, we, have, we analyzed each of these four groups by three time points three hours, 24 hours, and seven days. On our y axis, we have our different compounds that we analyzed it. We divided our compounds into five different groups for our root and three different groups for our leaf. We mainly wanted to focus on group four for the root and group two for the leaf. These compounds were significantly expressed in the salt tolerant species for both the control and the treatment. This demonstrates constituent defense as 
the salt tolerant species has adapted to its environment. These compounds were significantly expressed in the citrate cycle. So when salt stress occurs, hormones activate the constituent genes, which in turn affects the citrate cycle. Citric acid, succinic acid, and malic acid are highly upregulated in salt tolerant plants compared to the salt non tolerant cow. Um, these citric acid, succinic acid, and malic acid are very crucial for human health and will help in met metabolomic engineering. These compounds have been significantly expressed in salt tolerance and will help us understand the general gist for salt tolerance. Now I'm going to turn it over to Chica to talk about acknowledgments. So we'd like to acknowledge a number of people who contributed to the um, further further contributed to the research, research this summer. Um, we'd like to thank Dr. Han Yu from UNC Charlotte, who actually prepared our soybean and uh, sweet potato samples. We'd like to thank uh, Dr. Lee and Dr. Um, Han Yi from NC State, who contributed to the processing of our samples. We'd like to thank Dr. Jason, who contributed, the, um, contributed to the processing of our sweet potato samples. We'd also like to thank from the UNC Charlotte Bioinformatics team, Drs. Rob Reed and Steven, who actually helped us with the data, analy data analysis of our samples. And we'd also like to thank P2EP, um, our graduate mentor, Neha Mittal, and our principal investigator, Dr. Song, for allowing us the opportunity to work on these projects this summer. If you guys would like to know any additional information on our projects or would like to ask us any questions, please see us at posters five and six, our soybean and sweet potato respective projects. And this is just a couple of things that we learned this summer. Do you guys have any questions? No question, I would like to announce a dismissal for lunch. The program will reconvene at 1 p.m. and the buffet is in lobby. And we have posters next door. So I would like to invite you all just for the lunch and also come visit our post and talk more with our interns about their awesome research. See you shortly. Thank you. Mm -hmm.